Hello, everyone. My name's Lupe. I'm here with Mr. John Porter. He's going to introduce himself. Hi, I'm John Porter, class of 93. Awesome. Um, Mr. Porter, would you like to tell us more about what major you graduated with and what inspired you to pursue the major you did? Sure. Uh, I actually doubled majored and minored because I'm insane. Um, I have a major in poli sci and I have a major in international studies with an emphasis on uh, the People's Republic of China and a minor in Mandarin. Why that? I've always been interested in politics and I had an odd affinity towards China and I honestly didn't know why. And I later found out after I graduated that my father's father, so my grandfather, uh, actually served in China prior to World War II uh, as a Marine. And I had no idea, and I'm assuming I must have heard stories when I was a kid, and it just kind of seeped into the back of my brain and just had no idea about it. It subconsciously clicked. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, that's really amazing. Um, what do you think were the biggest experiences or resources that SU had that made the largest impact in your professional life? Oh, God. Um, the first probably would be the ability that SU gave me to do whatever I wanted to do. Um, so when I came to SU, like probably most college students, I kind of reinvented myself. Um, and one of the things that I helped do was found uh, with two other people, Alpha Phi Omega, on campus because service was always really important to me um, growing up. Um, and that's something I wanted to continue to do. And one of the last things I did um, before I graduated was do a big hurricane relief to Hurricane Andrew. Uh, and we brought something like 120 students we were able to find uh, a company that would volunteer or donate their tour buses and their drivers and drove us to Louisiana for four days. And we were able to raise like in a week, $30,000. And uh, it was just an amazing experience to, to go to a devastated area, to have all these, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, maybe 22 year old kids seeing tragedy and doing something about it tangibly. And that was pretty cool. Um, did a lot of other really good things with SU and APO, but that was probably the pinnacle of uh, doing that. Um, in terms of work work, um, the ability to process so much information, and I have no doubt it hasn't changed for you guys at all. It's probably gotten worse or, or better. Um, the amount of reading that we had to do. Um, I had in my senior year, um, there was a professor there named uh, Dr. Stephen Davidson. I, I don't think he's there anymore, um, but he was my advisor and he was also the main Chinese history teacher. And I was real interested in modern 20th century China. And so he and I talked about it the year prior and we designed a course just for me, an independent study just for me. And he had me read, 22 books in a semester and we're not talking little tiny books we're talking you know three four five hundred page books um, and so i think i estimated i read close to um, you know fifteen thousand pages worth of stuff and then synthesized that into a, a rather large paper on uh, the hundred flower movement and I'll never forget that as long as I live, even though I've got nothing to do with what I do now. And that was true throughout. And it, that, you know, when he dumped that on me, maybe to scare me, maybe just to not, that didn't like, okay, I guess that's next. Mm -hmm. And so reading the amount of information that I read at Southwestern, writing as much as I read at Southwestern, I think I can count on two fingers, the number of like multiple guest questions that I ever had for a test. I mean, they were all essay all papers. Um, and so when I got to law school, it was a breeze. It was easy. 
uh, I mean, relatively speaking to my colleagues, I mean, law school is never easy, but uh, compared to my colleagues who just struggled, uh, it was like, oh, okay, you got to read 300 pages a day, done, easy. What made you decide that you wanted to pursue law after undergrad? <laughs> uh, pure accident. Um, so I'll, I'll tell this the, a long story the short way. Um, so I could, after I graduated school, I could read Chinese relatively well. I couldn't speak it to save my life. I, I'm just tone deaf completely. Um, and, and Chinese is all about accents, accentuation of words, particularly in Mandarin. There, there's four words. And you can see me do this with my finger because that's how we were taught. Um, and I just had a really lousy ear for it. And so Dr. Davidson, uh, Lu Laosha, who was the Chinese teacher, recommended that I go back to China because I was able to do an independent study or summer abroad with um, Dr. Robinson, uh, Ken Robinson, and uh, my now wife, then girlfriend. We all went to Beijing for uh, a summer. And we went to Beijing, Beijing Yuyan Chuyan, which is a language school there. And my wife, she's got an amazing ear and she picked it up pretty easily. Again, mine's crap. Um, so they suggested I go to Hong Kong uh, because I wanted to go to graduate school to earn my PhD because I wanted to teach Chinese history. Because, you know, what else was I going to do with a Chinese degree at, you know, in the <laughs> early 90s? Um, and right before we were to immigrate to Hong Kong, the company that we were going to go work for went bankrupt. We were like, oh, crap, what do we do? And so my wife started working for the Austin Chronicle, um, and I started working for uh, a government agency called the Texas Medical Board. Then it was called the Texas Board of Medical Examiners, but now it's in the Texas Medical Board. And I got to know the lawyers there and they said, John, you think like a lawyer. Once I realized they weren't trying to insult me, they convinced me to go off to law school and went off to law school that way. So I had no intention, no desire to ever go to law school. I generally speaking, don't like lawyers, still don't like lawyers very much. Um, so I found one to it by accident because I found this job that I was pretty good at and got to know people and they thought I was pretty good at it. And one thing led to another and here I am years later, so. <laughs> really cool. It's, it's funny how everything works by chance, right? Yeah, yeah. the universe has been exceedingly good to me. <laughs> That's really nice. So whenever you were working with the Texas Board of Medical Examiners, what were you doing? When I first got there, again, I got there in a weird way um, because through Southwestern, uh, I got an internship at uh, in the Texas House of Representatives. And they happen to be in session, as you know, I'm sure most SU people know, um, the state legislature's in there for only for 150 days every other year. So I worked for um, a woman by the name of Representative Sonsfronia Thompson. She's actually still there in the Texas House. And she's got to be a million years old now. Um, and this was so long ago, Democrats were still in charge. Uh, so she had a, a, ch a chairmanship over the Texas Medical Board. And they were going through a rewrite of their law because every decade or so, every agency goes through what's called sunset. And so I, for whatever reason, she named me the liaison between the Texas House and the Texas Medical Board. And I was the liaison for this committee. And so I got to know the people there really well one thing led to another. Uh, once the session was done, and I, you know, this job in Hong Kong fell apart. Um, I applied for a job at the medical board. They remembered me, and so they hired me. Oh. And I was there as what they call a licensure investigator. Um, and um, I investigated doctors who were applying for licenses in Texas. And that's how I got to know the lawyers there, and one thing led to another. Um, then I went off to law school worked in a very large law firm, um, absolutely hated it. It was just every bad thing that you can think about lawyers, they all were in this one law firm. Uh, it was just an awful place. And then out of the blue, one day I get a call from my old boss 
Dr. Bruce Levy, who was then the executive director of the agency, he said, John, we can't pay you what they pay you, but would you willing to be willing to come back to work for us as a prosecutor? And I said, yes, please. Uh, quit that day. Super unprofessional, uh, but a liberating thing to do. Mm-hmm. And went back as a prosecutor for the medical board and did that, worked my way up the food chain and became ultimately director of enforcement for the agency. And so by the time I was 31, I was managing 47 employees and had a $7 million budget to play with. Uh, And did that until Dr. Levy lost his job for a lot of political reasons. We got a new guy, a new guy came in, that new guy and I did not get along at all. He had a very different philosophical approach to regulatory life than I did. And um, so the guys, same guys who convinced me to go off to law school had started their own law firm before that. And they had told me, John, whenever you wanna quit and see the light and come and do the right thing, um, join us. So I joined them. And so I've been with them ever since as a law partner. Now you work without prosecute. now you don't prosecute. Yeah, I'm a defense attorney now. So oh. I've get flip, completely flipped sides and now I defend doctors from the government is it was that transition hard from prosecuting to defending um i thought it would be but oops sorry i thought it would be but no kind of have a what we view as a high threshold um we don't take predators we don't take people who are utterly incompetent we don't take um what we consider bad people and, and so, you know, here, you know, everybody says we defend the innocent. Um, I, I can't say we defend the innocent, but I can say that we defend people that are good people who sometimes make bad decisions. In medicine, people expect and demand the perfection standard. Um, and, you know, that's not realistic. We're human beings working with human beings, working within human systems. And human beings screw up, patients screw up. Um, and systems screw up. And so the question is, can you learn from the mistakes that you make and not repeat them? Mm-hmm. And so that's what we try to do is try to rehabilitate people who make mistakes and you know, the people who don't make mistakes and who are just caught up in a bad situation because of you know, people just being upset, then you know, we want to defend those folks. So you mentioned that y'all can kind of choose who y'all... Mm-hmm. Choose. Okay, that's nice. Is yeah. that is that truth for like almost every firm? I'm just curious. depends how hungry you are. Um, you know, if if you're willing to say no sometimes, and sometimes honestly go through lean patches where you know you're not making as much as you would normally want to make, then yeah. If if you don't care about that. And, you know, some people don't care about that. And I think everybody deserves a defense. I just don't have to be the one that gives them that defense if I don't mm-hmm. think they're worthy. So, you know, for example, I, I got a call two weeks ago from a guy that got arrested for having child pornography. He's a physician. Um, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And, um, and it's not like he was accused of child pornography. He pled guilty to possession of child pornography. So, He was guilty, but again, not something that I want to deal with. Mm -hmm. So um, what are some skills or experiences that you would recommend for, that you recommend students looking into your field to have? Um, While you're still at SU, write a lot, but don't be afraid. And this was a mistake I made early on at Southwestern. Um, have your friends and colleagues look at your work. One, just to catch those silly mistakes, but two, to get feedback and, and to get pushback. Um, you know, for me and doing what I do, I want to be able to see all around me. I want to see 360 degrees. I, you know, if I only come in like this and that's all I see, then I'm doing myself a disservice and I'm doing my client a disservice. Mm-hmm. So, Don't be afraid to look at all perspectives. Get to know your professors. Uh, That's the beautiful thing about Southwestern. 
is that you have that one on one time that you don't get at most schools. Um, and, and get to know them, pick their brains, push, push on them too. And as long as you do it respectfully, they dig it. Um, and so definitely do that. Get an internship. Uh, that internship that I had at the Texas legislature turned into a career. Um, wasn't what I thought I was going to do. It's allowed me to do things that I never thought I'd have the opportunity to do. And it's been amazing. Don't limit yourself because the first person you run into at Southwestern, either an administration or you know a, a friend or a professor says no. Um, because the thing that SU has built for me is the first no is just a test of character. It's not a no. Uh, and if you never ask, the answer always is gonna be no. So push, 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 push. I'll give you a quick example day of freshman orientation I meet my now wife very oh, first day uh, and, and back back in my day make me sound really old <laughs> um, women and men had a curfew in the dorms men could not be in women's dorms past 10 and vice versa so we kind of thought that was ridiculous and so we started talking to the RAs who started talking to other folks and we got some petitions and we got that changed thank you <laughs> you're welcome and you know we didn't take no for an answer and finally we got up to uh the chief administration and ultimately talked to the president of the university uh that was roy Schilling at the time and roy's like okay yeah if that's what you guys want i think we can we can make that happen and within a year it happened don't take no for an answer because you can do it at, at, at Southwestern because it's small enough. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Mr. John Porter, for sharing all that information with us. It was really helpful. Oh, my pleasure.